Right, good evening everybody. Uh, we are one minute early, but we will start anyway. Um, thank you so much to each and every one of you for joining us today for our eighth uh, Pan-African Third Wednesdays Digital Hangouts tonight. Um, we welcome you all, everybody from South Africa. I see Paul is here, chapter head of Nigeria. Uh, shout out to Paul and shout out to Kakra. Welcome, guys, and welcome to your alumni members. This is our seventh online um, digital hangout, but our eighth um, alumni third Wednesday since we started in February. And I was just looking at the schedule for the rest of the year, and it's actually quite unbelievable that we've got two more third Wednesday sessions to go. So how time flies. Um, but yeah, it's really awesome to have you all here. Um, please, before we start, it would be lovely to get to know you all. Please let us know who you are in the chat. Uh, just tell us uh, who you are, where you're from, and what you look forward to uh, for tonight's session. Uh, and before we kick off, we're going to do it Henley style. And uh, Dean and Director John Foster Pedley, he's here tonight, and he's prepared something very special for us. Uh, John, if I can ask Matt, you. I really you have it. I've got all over the place. Hello. I was a few. And bless us. <laughs> over to you, John. Can we play something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I've been, hello, Bob and Steve and everybody, Chris. So, um, you know, after these professional musos playing, I've said I've got to play something. So I've got another thing. I can play a bit of blues. Mm -hmm. But I thought I've been fiddling around with a little piece for COVID. It's ever so peaceful and spring-like. Very quiet. I still can't play it properly, but it's a work in progress. This is a song I'm writing. So I'm just going to play it very gently as a peaceful intro. Okay. And it'll be all buzzy come my part. Anyway, it's a lovely play. Okay. <laughs> There you go. Yay. All buzzy, man. Excellent. Excellent. Amazing, John. Thank you so much. That was absolutely lovely. And um, do you want to say a few words, John? I know uh, that you are very good um, friends with Bob, Steve, and Chris. Uh, and we're very happy to have them here tonight. Um, so thank you so much for for gracing us with your other talents of guitar playing and i'm really really proud of you for putting together a nice piece at such a very short space of time uh john any few words you'd like to say please i think in front of no idea how difficult it was to sit in front of all these <laughs> professional musicians and rhythm geniuses on this call i know bob for a long time he also plays he plays a mean guitar i don't know chris and steve so well but i have the real privilege of actually sharing a house with bob for a time he's a marvelous educator marvelous trainer outdoor specialist um and i just can't wait to listen to them 
Um, and welcome to everyone who's on the call. It's wonderful to connect all with the alumni around Africa. Um, we're really cruising now. We actually produced a new vision statement for Henley, which is developing the leaders to build a fairer world. And I think that's a brilliant vision statement for Henley globally. Developing leaders to build a fairer world. Not all about corporate leaders who make a profit. It's about creating opportunity and possibility and prosperity. So um, I'm, and they're so excited. All, our, all our, uh, the UK staff and the people in Denmark and Germany and Malta and Finland, all those people are so excited about the possibility of getting closer to um, Africa and working with people in Africa. So um, you're top of the agenda. So I can't wait to hand over to these marvelous educators. Um, and I say that without irony and without hyperbole. So I'm really looking forward to hearing you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. And as he has alluded, we've got a really incredible lineup of speakers tonight. Um, who will be talking about managing human risk with virtual teams. They will do this in ping pong fashion. So it's very interactive. And we'll be giving us some tricks on how to uh, prepare for virtual screen-to-screen meetings and engagement. Um, we've got Steve, who's an American, and he's a high-level presentation coach, who's also based in France. Chris, who is an intercultural and change management expert, uh, Canadian, as well as Bob Larcher, who is a British independent consultant living in France and who has started work in mainstream leadership development. So without any further ado, I would love to hand over to Bob, who will uh, keep us engaged for the next 50 to 55 minutes or so. And um, if you would like to interact, please do put your comments in the chat and ask your questions in the Q&A button. Thank you very much and over to you, Bob. Okay, so thank you. Welcome to everybody. A big thank you to, uh, to Henley. <coughs> for inviting uh, Chris, Steve and myself to participate in this. Uh, we got the invitation uh, four or five weeks ago. <laughs> We've had a lot of sessions together on Zoom and we're excited to be here. Um, well, so I'm just a, a quick introduction. Uh, as uh, Mamu said, uh, Chris is Canadian, Steve's American, I'm British. Uh, we've known each other for about 20, 22 years now. Uh, although we come from different parts of the world, uh, we actually all live reasonably close together in the, the Toulouse area of France. Toulouse is in southwestern France, uh, towards the Spanish border. Uh, we, are, we will be classified as management consultants, probably international management consultants. Uh, we're relatively in interchangeable. We have a lot of common skill sets and we work together on common projects for, for common clients. Uh, but we each have our own uh, specialist area. Uh, uh, Chris is more culture, uh, organizational change. Uh, Steve is more communications, presentations. I've lost count of how many, how many presentations uh, Steve sees uh, per year. And my area is leadership. And we, we'll, we'll all say a little bit about, uh, about ourselves, a little bit more, uh, when we actually kick off the, uh, the conference. Uh, we've tried to build something which is interactive. So we're each going to present. We'd like to know a little bit about you uh, before we start. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to, uh, to Chris, who's going to ask you a couple of questions, and you'll be using the, uh, the chat function. So Chris, if you'd like to ask the, uh, the first question, thanks. There we go. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks very much, Bob. And uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, let's kick it off with uh, a simple question related to your experience in using screen to screen for meetings and such. On average, uh, how often, can you, you can just put a, a number in the chat, but how often would you be using screen-to-screen -screen meetings uh, that could be using your phone, a tablet, a computer? Um, and we'd like to find out what, what is your experience, generally speaking, and, and especially, I guess, in this particular time, which is um, lockdown and COVID and everything else. But what is your, let's have a few answers show up on the chat. The chat box, of course, is in your, um, toolbar there. You'll be able to type in a number and uh, we'll see what comes up. So we've got uh, every day about five, two to three per day. Okay, so we've, we're looking at quite a bit of experience here. 
And I'm sure that this experience will be very helpful for us uh, because we're looking to find out what, uh, what actually are the risks that you see uh, when you're working in this particular mode. Now, um, so I'm seeing that most of you are actually in the five to 10 region, roughly. Um, some more per week, but uh, some are actually doing about five per day. So um, this gives us a good indication of, of what, what to expect in terms of your, your own experience and knowledge. And that's great, thanks so much. Let's go on to the second question, Steve. Um, this next question's about the risks. And um, in the chat again, could you just put in a few words or one word uh, that would describe what are the kinds of risks that you face in this kind of um, screen to screen mode meeting or exchange? Um, and I guess um, we're not really talking about email per se, but we're really talking about something using either Zoom or Skype or MS Teams or these kinds of tools that I'm sure you're already using. So let's have your answers in the chat. Okay, so some people are, are mentioning power failures and okay, misalignment, a good point. Often we're finding that uh, people aren't speaking really on the same wavelengths. Um, psychological safety, interesting. A lot of miscommunication, certainly. People being inattentive, that's a good one. Okay. Uh, being, not being able to sense what's happening in the room, whatever that virtual room is about, that's great. Okay, uh, this is, these are really things we're gonna be talking about um, today, and that's the human aspect. Um, and what I'm seeing, in addition to the technological questions and difficulties, is um, a consequence of some of the human difficulties that we have. Of course, uh, let's keep in mind that it's not only about what takes place in the meeting, but also what takes place afterwards. So, okay, so lack of human contact. Uh, it's true that those Microsoft tools and such try and improve things with some interactivity, but uh, we are finding it's not at all the same as being in the same room with everyone. Uh, of course, there are advantages, but um, for this particular seminar, we're gonna be focusing on some of the difficulties. Okay, so in general, we see that communication can be uh, at the heart of, of these problems and, and a disconnection for different reasons. And what we'll see uh, through our three interventions today is that we'll probably have, um, we'll probably cover all of these areas, leadership, communication, and, and cultural context. So um, this, um, this is what we're gonna be focusing on, in fact. Thanks very much for your contributions. I'll hand it over now to Bob to kick things off with the topic of leadership and how that relates to this question of um, risk and remote meetings. Bob? You've got your mic, uh, you've got to turn your mic on, Bob. <laughs> There we go. I said to myself earlier, I'll turn my mic off and I won't forget to turn it back on. And what did I do? I forgot to turn it back on. Uh, there was an interesting comment from Mamo who said that 70% um, of our communication comes from our, our nonverbal our body language, which is really maybe the, the centerpiece of what I'm going to talk about. So my, my world is, uh, is leadership. Uh, uh, I've lost the screen. No, uh, my there. world is leadership. Uh, well, I've been working leadership now since September uh, 1986, so that's almost 35 years. Uh, I work with essentially corporate organisations at different levels of the different organisational levels, uh, and I, I try to help people to uh, to discover, uh, to develop, and to deploy their their personal leadership uh, in order to drive uh, transformations, be it a personal transformation, organisational transformation, or um, a societal transformation. So I'm going to talk about leadership impact. In the, in the post-COVID world, in the old face-to-face -face world, uh, verbal communication 
the, the, the words we use, the, the way the, the phrases we use, the sentences we use, complex words, simple words, etc. They accounted for about 7% seven, of our impact, of our leadership impact. Uh, behind the words, there's the way we say the words, what we call the paraverbal, the, uh, the, the tone, the volume, the speed, uh, the accent. I'm aware I have a, quite a strong accent. Uh, 38%. And a whopping, it's not, not as much as 70% as Mamo said, but at least 55%, sometimes more, which is down to our body language. Our gestures, the, the nod of the head, uh, the way we hold ourselves, our posture, the thumbs up sign, the wink of the eye, etc. All that, all that helps to, to create our leadership impact. Of course, screen to screen, it's disappeared. There's a very, very small percentage which is left, but it's no longer the 55%. And we have to replace that 55% with something else. And the something else is our leadership voice. It's our words, so we need to be concise, we need to be precise, you need to be clear about what you're saying, but also you need to color your voice. You need to use your voice to convey what you would be using your body to convey. So maybe if you're in a meeting and it's, uh, you feel it's urgent and we need to do something, maybe you stand up, uh, maybe you point, maybe you move around, or if you wanted to create uh, maybe more atmosphere, maybe you stand up, uh, to get a few people together and do something. Now, we can't do that. If you stand up, if I was to stand up now, I would disappear. So we have to replace that by something else. And that something else is our voice. So we have to color our voice. We have globally four color types to our voice. We have a red voice, and our red voice is used to convey urgency. So when we want to get things moving, instead of standing up, we will use a red voice. And I'll talk about our red voice uh, a little bit later, a fiery red voice. If you want to make things maybe a bit more convivial, a bit more lively, involve people a bit more inclusive, then we'd use our yellow voice, our, our sunshine yellow voice, our kind of warm voice, warm involving voice. If I want to have more maybe um, empathy, trust, then I'm probably going to use more my green voice, speak a bit slower, a bit calmer, be more interested in people. And if I want to show that I know what I'm talking about, I'm probably going to use my blue, my authority and voice, which shows the people I know what I'm talking about. So we need to modulate our voice and use our voice depending on the message we want to convey during the meeting. So maybe to take a look behind the, um, behind the, the colors. So we have our four colors. Uh, if anyone uh, here today knows anything about uh, insights, luminous spark, uh, young, etc., then you will find the, uh, the young, young colors here. So we have our red voice. Our red voice is used to create urgency. The object of our red voice is to create action. We want to get things moving in the meeting. We want things to happen. Enough talk, people need to make decisions, people need to do things. So I'm probably going to decide to speak somewhat faster than I have been doing. I'm probably going to raise my voice. A very direct tone, a very pressing tone, with very few breaks. I don't want people to get a word in edgeways. I don't want people to stop me. I want to make it clear that we need to move forward. On the other hand, if I want to convey maybe conviviality by a nice smile, a hand gesture, things I can no longer do in a screen to screen meeting, I'm going to use my, my yellow voice, which is to create inclusion. Yeah, so my tone is probably gonna come down a little bit slightly. My volume is gonna come down a little bit slow, slightly. My, my speed a little bit slightly and probably a bit more enthusiasm in my voice, a bit more spontaneity, a bit more variation of the rhythm, a few breaks here and there, but I want to get people involved. If we move on to the, uh, the left side of the wheel, maybe if I want to show uh, empathy, my objective being to, to reassure people, show that people I'm supporting them, I'm listening to them, my volume is probably going to go down significantly. I'm going to have pauses, thoughtful breaks, where I need to think things through. Maybe I'm looking for my words. I'm going to speak slowly, calmly, and quite a relaxed tone. It's not an excited tone. I'm not trying to get move, me, people to move somewhere. I'm trying to get people to come down, have empathy, and show that I'm thinking about. And finally, my blue authoritarian voice to show that I know about things, I, I know knowledge, and I want to demonstrate what I know. There, my volume would probably move up again. My, my speed would move up. Uh, my tone would be conclusive. Not direct, but conclusive. A conclusive tone is really, I'm saying things, 
and I'm not giving people the opportunity to contradict me. I know my subject. There is X, there is Y, and there is Z. It's very conclusive. It's not, mm, yeah, may, maybe there's X, there's, there's, there's Y, uh, and there's Z. It's very conclusive. There's X, there's Y, there's Z. And my voice is saying, I know this. I've studied the subject. The rhythm is quite clipped with very distinct breaks. It wouldn't be, there is X, there is Y, there is Z. It would be, there is X, there is Y, there is Z. And we need to use all of these, uh, these colors to our voices during our, during our interventions, during, um, during our virtual meetings to replace what people are no longer seeing. They need to hear what they have previously see. We need to be aware in using the, uh, the speed of our voice. Sometimes if we speak, I nod my head so that uh, Steve uh, clicks on the, uh, on the button. So if I speak too slowly, I want it to be a uh, calm atmosphere. If I speak too slowly, I can also induce boredom. On the other hand, if I speak too fastly, yeah, which transmits engagement, etc., it can also transmit maybe anxiety and maybe nervousness. I I'm someone I, I tend to get quite um, passionate about what I talk about. I'm very aware. Uh, and I know sometimes I can speed up, so I have to be aware that uh, I'm trying to show engagement. It's not that I'm anxious. It's simply that I'm passionate about what I'm doing. We also need to be, uh, be careful, not just with regards to the rhythm, but also the speed, the, the tone, excuse me. So lowering your voice tends to, tends to increase the emotional involvement of people. If I drop my voice down, already people are going to be working harder to listen. If I raise my voice up, Raising my voice tends to move people towards more physical involvement. If you raise your voice, people kind of sit up. Oh, something's going to happen. Now, all of this we would probably have done uh, unconsciously during our face-to-face -face meetings, quite con unconsciously and often quite, quite naturally. During our screen-to-screen -screen meetings, we no longer have those unconscious clues that we would pick up for people. So we need to be very conscious of how we're using our voice. So maybe some simple tips to help you better use your voice uh, during the, the, the different parts of a, of, a, of a virtual meeting. So before, during and after. So maybe before the, uh, before the meeting, you need to prepare your voice. Sounds a, a strange sort of thing to say, to prepare your voice. Yeah. I've been speaking for 30 years. Do I need to prepare my voice? Yes, you need to consciously prepare your voice. What am I going to speak? What type of voice do I want to use? It's a good idea to record yourself to hear how you sound. I remember when I, when I first heard myself speaking uh, French, I discovered I speak French in exactly the same way that I speak English. So that's quite interesting to know. And you need to identify during the meeting, when do I really need to be aware of the color of my voice? Is there a point in time during the meeting where really there I need to show authority and I don't want to show conviviality. So I need to prepare myself during the meeting. It's a good idea to have uh, water around, yeah? Your voice dries up. You don't want to dry up just at the wrong moment, just when it's your chance to intervene and say something really crucial. Ah, ooh, ah, my voice is gone. So it's good to have water around. You need to stay focused on the discussion. You need to follow what's, what's going on. You don't just turn off the, uh, the mic, turn off the, uh, the camera and not watch. You need to stay focused. And you need to use your voice consciously rather than unconsciously. And after the, the meeting, and in fact, after the meeting, we're in the before of our next meeting. So you need to listen to recording of the meeting that you just had, listen to your voice, maybe get feedback on how your voice was perceived. I wanted to sound authoritarian. I wanted to sound as though I know what I was talking about. Is that how people perceived it? And practice using your least comfortable voice. You know, we all have a comfortable voice. Some people are great at creating urgency, giving orders, being direct. Some people are great at being convivial. I know I, I have a bit of a reputation for being quite a, a blue voice. Uh, I, like, uh, I like explaining things to people. People often tell me that I'm, uh, I'm clear, precise, etc. Uh, but we need, to, we need to be able to, to use consciously all of our voices. So we really need to create kind of a rainbow voice. So you need to concentrate also on those which are, are least comfortable for you. So I think that's enough from this, uh, this English accent. So we're going to hand over to a more uh, Canadian French accent. So I'm going to hand over to, to Chris, who's going to be talking about culture and organizational change. I don't know what you'll see French in my accent, but anyway. Um, yes, thanks, Bob. Uh, in fact, uh, my world is one of uh, change 
and how cultures adapt to change. So that can be in uh, privatizations, it can be in mergers and acquisitions, it can be in restructuring projects, uh, defining culture, uh, all these kinds of projects. And very often uh, we find that people aren't aligned. The risk of course being that uh, people are just not speaking the same language, not understanding the same things, uh, not connecting in the way that they should be connecting. And of course, this is much more difficult when we have uh, these, these types of projects. But um, luckily, I mean, I've had uh, quite a bit of experience internationally, so the cultural, the cultural aspect doesn't worry me so much. Uh, I've had the good fortune of working in about 30 African countries. Uh, I see there's someone from Nigeria here. I was working at a proposal in Nigeria in the water sector. I worked in the water sector a couple of years ago. And, uh, and I've worked in other parts of the world, perhaps in about 90 countries or so. so Culture is really part of what I do every day. Um, now, for this particular uh, seminar, I mean, this my presentation will be using a metaphor. The metaphor is a tree. And um, when we're working uh, in a face-to-face -face meeting, we have a lot of the visuals that we're you know, accustomed to. Um, but so that, uh, that means that we're looking at the rituals. That means that we're sensing the environment we're working in. Body language is, of course, uh, always important. Um, but as Bob pointed out, uh, a lot of these things in a virtual screen to screen context uh, have been actually wiped out. Uh, the body language is very limited. The rituals are no longer there. <clears throat> uh, the norms have been also changed as we're working differently. So the next uh, side of this really is making sure that in spite of this, um, this work that we're doing on the visual side, we're also exploring the root zone. We no longer have those pointers that we're accustomed to. We have to use something else. And this is what I'm inviting you to do in this particular presentation. So that if we're going to avoid some of the risks of misalignment and uh, losing people on the way or creating conflict sometimes, we have to watch out for our attitudes, our own emotions, <clears throat> and checking what are the rules we have to establish in this new cultural context. Um, make sure we explore also the needs and intentions and expectations that other people have. If we go even further down, we have beliefs and assumptions and, and values that might be challenged in the way we communicate, the way we express ourselves, or the way we set up these meetings. So what can we do? Well, let's look at a few strategies. First of all, we need to plan the cultural interaction. That means uh, a lot of preparation in understanding who my interlocutors are, what my aim is in this particular meeting. And of course, during the meeting, we have to adapt our language. Bob's talked about this, but this also means not only the accent, maybe it means simplifying your language in such a way that people can understand more clearly. It might mean slowing your, your, your actually, your, your way of speaking, uh, and, and that's also going to be useful. Um, there are many intercultural models that we can use to understand cultures, and here are just a few that are mentioned. You might be aware of some of these. Hall, Hofstetter, Lewis, the Trompenars. Hall, Hofstetter, Lewis look at national cultures. Trompenars looks at corporate cultures. Um, so these will be different. And for example, I know that having worked in Africa, what, what's very important is the practical side of what we're trying to accomplish. In France, very often it's the theoretical side, which is what people are interested in. So understanding those differences is gonna make a big, uh, I would say a better connection with people when, when working across different cultures. Um, also, you have to probably connect more often uh, than in a face-to-face uh, -face setting because you have missed probably some of the cues. And so you need to somehow develop a more regular connection and apply what we call active listening, which is concentrated listening, but it also means making sure you're asking questions. Now let's explore a little bit what's below the surface, some of the pointers or cues that we'll need to keep in mind. Um, our attitude. I think uh, humility is going to be an important factor here. I underline the word respect here because it really is essential, I think, in everything that we do across cultures, and even more so in a remote setting. Um, empathy will mean that we connect with the people, we understand their setting. I mean, 
in some of the places we work with, uh, the internet connection will be bad. And so perhaps we have to understand that uh, we have to reschedule a meeting or perhaps uh, reduce some of the visuals to keep the bandwidth uh, in line with the communication. We might want to set ground rules. For example, if I'm working in Saudi Arabia, uh, I won't schedule a meeting on Friday afternoon, uh, but uh, the, I'll ask them not to schedule a meeting on Sunday. So uh, that kind of understanding will help. Um, if we continue down into the root zone, we, we have to make sure that we clarify our expectations in the project or in the meeting. What are our needs? And we can ask these kinds of questions. This will help us build trust. Now, again, trust is underlined here because it's most essential. Um, how do we do that? Well, we deliver on our commitments. We, uh, we, we seek to establish transparency. Now, uh, the important thing here, of course, is not to take things for granted. You might perfectly understand how this works in a face-to-face -face meeting, but in a virtual meeting, things take a different tone, a different shape, a different understanding. So make sure you check your ego. Uh, that's where humility comes in. But um, the way you come across is going to be important. And the way you inf invite people to, to explain what their situation is, is going to help you with that. Curiosity, openness, honesty, all are parts of this. And of course, a fair amount of tolerance and acceptance. But do, I, I must emphasize that you do need to do your homework and understand the culture that you're working with and, and try and relate to them, connect with them. Now let's look at a few takeaways. <clears throat> Before the meeting, of course, um, you need to explore. You need to investigate. Uh, what some of the characteristics of the national culture are, but if you have information about the corporate culture, even better. If you're working in a functional culture, like uh, finance culture or HR culture or marketing culture or IT culture, they may also have differences there that you need to take into consideration. Um, and prepare yourself, prepare your mental attitude. That's gonna be most important. Um, and finally, uh, I would say in the, in the, prepare in the preparation stage, uh, make sure that you adjust your expectations and objectives for the meeting so that you don't get disappointed or that the other people don't get disappointed either. During the meeting, um, adapt. Adapt to uh, the way people are exchanging with you. Adapt to what you hear. Um, and of course, continue investigating in that meeting, finding out what people are our thinking and, and understanding. You might want to repeat and formalize what's been accepted in that meeting. A meeting, for example, in America always ends up with a decision. A meeting in France is usually just a discussion. So understand what people are expecting and what has been concluded in that meeting. At the end of the meeting, well, um, make sure you keep your commitments because that's going to go a long way in establishing that trust. Uh, follow up on your communication with perhaps an email, summing up some of the points that you made and making sure that you're uh, not misinterpreting those. And of course, as you succeed in this exchange, acknowledge that success, celebrate it together with the different groups you're working with and continue learning in how to do this effectively, uh, perhaps formalizing some of that learning and exchanging with the people uh, on what really works or what might not have worked so well. Of course, there are a lot of anecdotes that people have, um, but uh, we don't have much time for that today. I'd like to hand things over now to Steve, who is going to explore the, the whole nature of communication, which is a central part of this. Steve? Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, in fact. Uh, presentations and communication is what I've been dealing with for the last 30 plus years. And to answer Bob's question earlier, I see roughly about 600 presentations per year. Uh, so what have I learned over the last 30 years? Well, basically everything that Chris and Bob have said will have absolutely no impact without the right communication. And above and beyond all of that, uh, we have to look at what this is, link is to leadership. And for me, all leaders know that the world belongs to those who know how to speak. And it's all about the story that you tell, the engagement that you have with your voice and the story that you're telling. 
You know, about 33 years ago, PowerPoint came on the market with Microsoft, and we all saw the damage that that has caused to communication. People thought that the tool would do the job instead of the, the, the person. And today we're seeing the same type of shift where people are thinking that Zoom and Meet and Teams and webinars, this new technology is going to do the job for them and they don't have to prepare much. Well, that's not actually true because leadership is not that. Slides don't lead, people lead. And for people to lead, I'd like to introduce a term that I coined many years ago, it's what I call leadership by empathy. And leadership by empathy actually means thinking why people want to listen to you. Well, if you're bringing them value and answers to the questions that they have, then that's a positive element. So I'd like to show you over the next few minutes, a very simple three-step method that's going to make you apt to communicate better, apt to present better, and it's going to be very easy and simple to follow. The first thing to do is to analyze your audience. Now, people have been saying, analyze your audience, find out what they want for years. And I got a bit sick and tired of hearing, analyze your audience, because there was no method. So I came up with my own method that I call the frequently asked question method. And basically what this means is to put yourself in the position of your audience in three periods of time, before your communication, during your communication, and after your communication. Let me explain a little bit. Before your communication means when someone sees the title of your intervention or the subject that you're going to present, put yourself in their position and write down or type on a Word document all of the questions that you think they would have before they actually came to hear, to, hear, to hear you speak. These are what I call the before questions. Write out the simple ones, the stupid ones, the most silly ones can actually be quite interesting. But put them in a, in a Word document to have your own database. Enrich this database with the during questions. And the during questions are all the questions that they would have if they could interrupt you at each and every moment. You know they're going to have a question on this slide, write the question out, what it would be. So, they're not going to interrupt you verbally, but mentally they are. But put these in your database as well. And last, take a look at the questions after. Now the after questions are all the questions that you hope they don't, they don't ask, but if they do, they could put you a little bit ill at ease, whether it's based on your methodology, the competition, the pricing, you know the difficult questions. So put a database together before, during, and after, according to that specific audience. Then the next step is very simple. Prioritize. Prioritize, cluster them into three, four, or five major chapters. And if you put these chapters into a simple chronological or pedagogical or whatever order makes sense to you, then actually you have the overview of your presentation because your presentation should be no more or no less than proactively giving them what they came to hear. So, once you have that, then you can start to practice and train. And the third step is to train. And what I mean by training is thinking about what you're going to say. What is the story you're going to tell? So I say, write it out or type it, put it in a Word document. Write out every word that you want to say. There are some great voice to text apps. Even Word has now a microphone to go voice to text. Put that into your Word document because what it will do is it will help you focus on what you need to say in the given time slot that you're given. You should know that we speak at about an average 100 to 150 words per minute. This is for an international audience. Now, if you put that into other terms, it basically means 10 simple sentences. So you do the math, write out every word you want to say, then I say read it. Read it out loud. There may be some words that you thought you wanted to say, but you couldn't, or the ideas didn't flow well, so rectify it, change it. It's in a Word document, it's not in stone. Nobody gets it right first time. So read, rectify, then take out a highlighter pen and reduce it. Reduce it to key concepts. Highlight what you want to do and throw away all of the other elements and just keep what you've highlighted. Then you can rehearse, practice, practice, practice. The great golfer that I'm sure many of you know, Gary Player, said the following. He said, the more I practice, the luckier I get. And that's absolutely true for every communication that you have. So that's the first step 
analyze, prioritize, and train. So how can we now put this into some type of a structure? Well, we have the clustering, but I want you to see it in a different way. I want you to think about what an architect does. Architects, what they do is very simple. The first thing that they look at are the frequently asked questions. They think, what does my customer want to do? What, does, what are the specifications? What do they desire? From that specifications, then and only then does the architect draw up what I call his unique residual message, meaning what is going to remain long after he's finished his job? What will somebody say one week after your presentation to somebody else? It's very simple. It can be one simple idea, one simple thing that you're proving. Once you have that, what does the architect do? Well, they drop a plan, a tailored plan to build that specific monument that's relevant to those specific specifications. Then after that, they then finally order the material and make the transitions. Now, that's the right way to prepare for communication. But unfortunately, I know a lot of you don't do it that way. If you're like most of the people I coach, they do it totally backwards. They go from the material, meaning they'll cherry pick some slides off their server, throw it into some type of a plan if possible, forget about any messages, and forget about what the specifications are. Now, if that's the case, you can obviously see that that's destined to fail. So let's no longer do it that way. Let's change and do it the other way around with the customer-centric approach. So for me, the takeaways that I want you to remember are very simple. That's the wrong way, change the way you're doing. It might seem a little bit longer, but it will be a lot more efficient. Before your presentation, analyze your audience with frequently asked questions. Put yourself in their position. Get into the leadership by empathy. And empathy means I have to see it from your point of view. Prepare what you want to say. What's the story you're going to tell? And keep it short and simple. Don't make it long, don't make it complicated. In the during process, my number one quick win that I tell everybody is if you think you are speaking too slowly, you're probably speaking at the right speed. Do you think that I'm speaking to you right now too slowly? Well, I do, I do. I have to contradict my brain that says, Steve, you are speaking too slowly, and then I say, shut up. No, you're not, you're speaking at the right speed. Until you can get to that mental contradiction, you'll be speaking too quickly. And for an international audience, it's very difficult. So, second thing, use your eyes and voice to transmit leadership. We look at your eyes, we look in this triangle of communication to see if you're actually telling the truth or not, and we can hear it in your voice. Manage your webcam. Remember, it should be your best friend. Your webcam is someone that you want to intellectually seduce. So, keep that in mind. And last but not least, seek feedback for improvement. It's very easy to make a video and to, to have a, a recording of your video, whether it's on Zoom or anywhere else, and find three areas that you want to improve. Perfection is something that we never uh, obtain, but we always strive for it. And that's the whole essence of progression uh, in your communication. So for me, that wraps up what I wanted to say. I'm going to hand the, the ball back over to Chris, who's going to sum up and give some ideas for question and answers. All right, Chris. Mike, Chris. Yes, I got it. Uh, sorry, summing up here is on the slide. You can see the various uh, pointers we've, we've pulled out. Um, what we'd like is for you actually to to throw some questions at us on any other topics that we've mentioned here, and uh, we'd be happy to, to field them. Uh, I think we've got uh, 10 or 15 minutes for that. Um, but let's see what, uh, what comes up. If you have any questions you want to type in the chat or uh, mention uh, orally, you can go ahead. But uh, we, we'd be very happy to see what, what has stimulated you in this particular session around these three points. And, some of the difficulties, I guess, that uh, you have faced perhaps in your meetings. So, uh, we've got one question here about uh, writing out what you want to say word by word. Um, it's an embodied way to hear yourself. Uh, that may be a comment, but what, what would the question be, Anna B? 
Maybe I why should you do it? Maybe why should you do it? Yeah. Well, the very simple, the, the most difficult thing for people to manage in communication is to scope the beast of their subject that they want to discuss into a small time frame. And I found that by writing out your story and sticking to your story, you can actually eliminate the excess baggage. Now, 100 to 150 words a minute is just a general rule. But if you practice writing out what you want to say in the first step, you can get less and less dependent on what you're saying uh, in, in exact words, but at least you're in the time frame. Anybody can speak for 45 minutes, but it takes preparation to speak in five to 10 minutes. That's basically why I want you to start thinking about writing out what you want to say. Okay, do we have any other questions? I see some comments that people are making about, about this as being useful. They like uh, the metaphors we're using and uh, I think that's being appreciated. Uh, comments about Steve's uh, actually demonstrating the speed with which to communicate well, that's been appreciated. What, um, what questions might you have? Anyone from, from the audience? Feel free, this is an opportunity to challenge us or to answer some of those questions you might be having. Um, and of course, yes, we're seeing that we've tried to focus on before, during, and after, but obviously everything will be conditioned by the before. So that bit can't be skipped. The during, is you're gonna be thinking on your feet. But um, if you haven't prepared properly, it'll be much more difficult. You know, here's a question, Chris. By Barry, what advice do you have to re-video, have video and audio set up? Well, <laughs> uh, video and audio set up, I'm not sure I understand the question, but I, I think uh, what you mean is uh, uh, when working across different cultures, um, I would say make sure that uh, people have compatible systems. Um, it's a technical question perhaps, but it's important because uh, perhaps we're all used to using Zoom, perhaps not. Um, that can put one of the groups at a disadvantage. And if they're at a disadvantage, um, the communication is not going to be at par and, and you might find yourself creating a problem that could have been avoided from a cultural perspective. Okay. Um, so I see a question about uh, cultural sensitivity here. Um, if, uh, yes, for example, if by studying some of the models in culture, you'll see that the way we uh, address risk is quite different. So um, knowing that, for example, by studying Hofstetter, you can find out what uncertainty avoidance index is about and find out whether some people enjoy risk and other people shy away from risk. That's a cultural thing from a national perspective. So there's, there's a, a way of exploring, I would say, um, questions that might arise from a, from a diversity point of view, from a culturally diverse audience. Um, Bob, something to add you were going to say? Yeah, I think for something very, very I mean, if it, culturally speaking, it's maybe more about uh, quite simply time zones, a personal experience. Uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a freelance journalist and I'm for, for a, 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 an online magazine. And I'm part of an international team and we're, we're spread all over the world. Uh, and they always plan the meetings for kind of two o'clock French time. So there's some Australians who, who just can't participate. It's very, very difficult for them. So I, I made the very simple suggestion of saying, you know, we, we, maybe we need to each sacrifice. You know, we, we each maybe need to get up at a, a difficult time of day or go to bed at a difficult time of day to show that we are actually uh, sensitive to other people's cultures, other people's time frames. So it's sometimes it's very simple, very, um, very pragmatic things to show that you're actually caring and you've taken into account that uh, uh, maybe you're just, uh, you're just going to bed and they're just getting up in the morning. But I was, about, I was about, in fact, I was just about to answer a question in the chat. Somebody asked a question about um, uh, virtual backgrounds. Mm. Hello, I, I, too many questions have gone now, but someone said, what do you think about virtual backgrounds? Very interesting question. Uh, I launched a, a poll on, on LinkedIn uh, yesterday. I asked exactly that question. Do you use or not uh, virtual backgrounds? 
Uh, I've only had about 30 responses up to now, but 27 said no, and three said uh, yes. And personally, um, I'm, I tend to be more against virtual backgrounds than I am for. Uh, already, um, we, we lose a lot in terms of people's body language. Uh, I said earlier, we have uh, 55% has gone from 55 to maybe two or three percent. And often the, 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 the virtual background, you know, if I move around, my hand distorts, it's not clear. And I think it, the virtual background at the moment can actually have a negative impact on our body language. So I, I, I go more for a normally a kind of a neutral background uh, where I can express myself uh, without my, my body language being distorted, such that I'm not perceived uh, wrongly by other people. It's funny uh, how that uh, question might also have a cultural connotation because um, if you have some things that are very culturally connotated in the background of your office, um, that might draw people's attention away from what you're trying to, to say. So a neutral, <clears throat> then the idea of neutrality is quite good. I have a question here about uh, how do you handle senior leaders who try and derail uh, mm -hmm. through one question away from the agenda? Um, and uh, I guess uh, moderator, my, my answer to that would be a moderator uh, <clears throat> to, I guess, try and look at the time frame that we've got and maybe beforehand um, have a little chat with that senior leader to see whether they have a particular point to get across so there's no hijacking. Um, <clears throat> I don't know, Bob, you want to add something to that? Yeah, maybe. Um... A personal experience, uh, when I was a young, uh, a young consultant, when I first started working for Airbus in Toulouse, uh, I was working with the, uh, the C, I had a lot of very, very senior people. We had a meeting which I was supposed to be running and they started talking about all sorts of things that weren't on the, the agenda for the meeting. And I was kind of sitting there watching them ping-ponging backwards and forwards. And I just, I, I kind of stood up and I said, uh, gentlemen, can we get back to the agenda, please? And they all went, oh, really sorry, Bob, really sorry. Yes, yes, what's next on the agenda? So I think sometimes yeah. it's just maybe taking your courage, <clears throat> doing it in a nice way, not, not unpleasant, but just standing up or saying, excuse me, we, we do have an agenda to, 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 to respect. And often people are simply, they've forgotten or they've been, they've, been, uh, they've been caught up in their excitement or their passion for something, and they just need to be nudged, nudged back online. There's Standing one, up, of course, in a virtual meeting is difficult. Steve, you want to add something? Yeah, there's, there's one question that is also in there along about timeline and Zoom fatigue. And this is, some, this is an issue that we've seen, especially since the arrival of COVID. And the whole concept of uh, virtual versus face-to-face -face presentations. And uh, I launched a survey that I invite you to take if you haven't taken it yet uh, on our website, www.apppresentations.com, uh, which asks you about how you prefer uh, the new paradigm compared to the old. And one of the biggest answers that came out of the more than 350 people who have answered the survey is there is definitely Zoom fatigue. Uh, there is all communications today on any platform have to be a lot shorter. Uh, that's, for example, why we decided, each one of us, to keep our intervention somewhere around the eight to 10 minute maximum, because the moment that you go over, it gets extremely tedious. And pay attention to what your slides look like. Uh, there is an incredible impact uh, so that people aren't reading and reading and reading for 45 minutes. And that has a, an enormous cultural impact when it's definitely not your mother tongue. And I guess if you have the time, uh, you can engage in, in discussions um, with the participants or use different uh, apps that are quite interactive. Uh, at the end of this presentation, we would like to invite you to um, stay on for a few minutes and uh, check out one of the apps that we, I like to use. It's called WooClap, but uh, maybe we can just <laughs> field another question or two. Um, we, we still have... Uh, a few minutes left. Um, the Mate, question, sorry. There's a question which is interesting. What's the best, best approach <clears throat> to follow up communica communication after a meeting? I don't, I don't know if there's, there's a best approach, but I think uh, to, to use the, um, the technology available 
I mean, even, du even during this, uh, this session, someone actually contacted me, someone from within the meeting actually contacted me on WhatsApp and I replied to them on WhatsApp. So I think you need to use a variety of technology. Uh, I think uh, even some, a simple phone call, maybe if you had a bit of a, a, bit of a, a, bit of a conflict with someone during the meeting, it wasn't clear, maybe a quick phone call just to, to check out how the person felt. Uh, yeah, my perception was this, uh, maybe, maybe I, I misinterpreted what I saw, what I heard uh, to, uh, to, to maybe um, stop what, what may become a, a big fire. So I think it depends on the type of on, on the type of situation. Clearly, minutes of the meeting, uh, maybe a quick WhatsApp, a quick one-on-one, -on -one, a telephone, or a Skype. Uh, just use the technology available. I guess if we come back to the question of your attitude, if your intention is a positive one, you'll find your communication will be much more flowing. Uh, don't write that email if you're in an angry mood. Uh, make sure that uh, you know things calm down and you you address it from a respectful perspective uh, calmly and diplomatically I would say that's probably my hint on that question um, so, 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 something I always say with um, if, you, if you're having difficulty with someone and you need and you want to uh, you want to talk to them about the difficulties talk don't talk about the person talk about the difficulty don't say oh, you're a really difficult person. You're you're aggressive. Uh, you're you're this. You're that. Try to say uh, I, I found your behaviour aggressive. Yeah, I, I found you difficult during this session. So it's not it's not attacking the person. It's more talking about the person's behaviour. Or you talk about your feelings. I felt this was a comment which uh, I I took uh, as a as an attack. Maybe it's that's my responsibility. But I guess that's just simple nonverbal communication. Um, I think we're coming around uh, actually to the top of the hour pretty soon. Um, we do have this little WooClap exercise uh, after the meeting, and um, <clears throat> but perhaps uh, we can show the next slide, Steve. Um, I can wrap up. Yeah, for the wrap up. <clears throat> and over to. Yeah. So basically, we hope that we really enlighten you uh, with some numbers and elements on the bottom. Uh, thank you. Merci. Gracias. Obrigado. Asante sana. <laughs> Danke schön. And uh, before we go, uh, I'd like to hand over back to uh, Mamo for any closing words. And then we can do our little WooClap And then we session. go back to do our WooClap <clears throat> for those who want to do the WooClap. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen. That was absolutely insightful. Um, can you hear me? I had some comments that yeah. uh, people couldn't hear me. Um, is, can you hear me? We yes. can hear you, yes. yes. Okay, great, fantastic. Thank you so much for the lovely session. Um, for those of you who can stay to um, check out the Wood Club uh, app, I think you should, uh, but please feel free to, to do that. Um, and um, I would like to hand over to Paul to quickly um, tell us about next month's um, third Wednesday's Digital Hangout. Him, uh, he is the chapter lead for Nigeria alumni and um, him and his team are hosting next month. So just uh, some short and brief words from Paul. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Mamo. Thank, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me, Mamo? Yes. Lovely. Thank you, Paul, Steve, and Chris. It's been a wonderful uh, presentation. I've actually learned a lot from um, what you guys have shared starting from leadership, communication, and culture, it's been amazing. So I'm happy to say that the Nigerian chapter will be hosting next Wednesday's um, third Wednesday's event in Nigeria, and then we hope to bring in very interesting speakers just like you so that we keep the momentum because your presentation has set the ball on a very high tone. So I thank you one, once more for your time, and I want to welcome the entire community that please join us for the 10 Wednesday that Nigeria will be hosting. Thank you so much, and do have a great evening. 
Awesome. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, and before everyone leaves, I would just like to let you know that at the end of the session, there is an evaluation form. It's going to take less than a minute to complete. We appreciate your feedback. So please do um, complete the form. It's just three questions. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for attending. And for those of you who can stay um, for a few more minutes to check out the WooClap app, you're welcome to do so. So handing over back to the Jains. Thank you very much, okay. Steve, Chris, and Bob. Thank you. Thank you, Mamo. Thank you to everyone for your participation. Don't forget the WooClap. Here we go. Here we go. So um, WooClap is something you may be aware of. It's, it's a very versatile app. It can be used in uh, presentations remotely. Um, what it is, is a, an application that allows you to do brainstorming or testing or polls or word clouds. We're gonna test it with a word cloud. Um, now, if you open up on one of your devices, it could be your phone, it could be your tablet or your computer, uh, another page <clears throat> without disconnecting from this session, you can you'll see an invitation to fill in a code. Uh, the code in this particular exercise, I've set it up. It's L-X-D-X-E-N, typed in capital letters. And so if you type that in, uh, you'll see a question arising, which uh, asks you to say, just type in a few words that describes what you felt about this session. And uh, we'll see what, what happens in this word cloud as, as your impressions come up. So I invite you now to go into www.wooclub.com. You don't have to sign up. They don't, might ask you to sign up. You don't have to do that. But there will be a little box where you type in a code. And uh, based on that code, uh, you'll be able to input one or several words. And we'll see what words come up. We'll have a nice word cloud. So, as the words come in, uh, I'll, uh, I don't know, have I got access to... You know, I'll stop sharing now. Okay, you well, yeah, I guess what I'll do is uh, you stop sharing and I'll open up my sharing so we can see the words coming out together. Uh, so, let me just see. Please show the uh, code again. Yeah, uh, it's... Um, the code for the WooClap is actually, um, what is it now? Oh, uh, there, there it is at the top. Thank you. Yeah. So here are some of the wonderful words you've put up. Uh, and if people are using several of the same words, as you can see here, the words get bigger. So you can ask people to input their ideas, their brainstorming, their impressions, and it automatically uh, shows it up in, a, in an exciting way on the screen. So uh, with that little dynamic, um, uh, we want to thank you very much for your active participation and uh, hope that we might have a chance to interact with you at some time in the future. Uh, WooClap, by the way, can also be used to show videos. Uh, it can be used um, for testing people, testing people's knowledge. Check it out. It's very intuitive and uh, you, you'll find it uh, quite a versatile tool to spice up your virtual meetings. There you have it, Mamo. So hand it over to you. And Lovely. We can, yeah, we can leave it at that uh, session where we're actually seeing the words appear as they as they get typed in. Yeah. It's absolutely incredible and it's so lovely to see that it was a very insightful session, relevant, useful. Thank you very much everybody. I think now more than ever empathy will take us a long way in whatever we do and whatever intentions we have, uh, whether in work or with family or in social spaces. I think empathy for me is the key takeaway in terms of um, engagement with others. Thank you so much, uh, gentlemen. And um, it was really, really lovely to have you. 
and we really look forward to working more with you all. Um, yeah, so so thanks a lot. And see everybody next month. Every third Wednesdays of the month, uh, we connect with alumni all over the continent and all over the world. So we can't wait to see you in October for our second last session of third Wednesdays in 2020. Have a fabulous evening and uh, see you next time. All the best. Good night. Thank you. All the best to you. Bye. 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 Bye.